Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, this is the artist circle for those of you that are new to this platform here at the Fearless Artist. Um, I'm going to run through a few announcements um, and then we'll get started. So our next TFA pop-up 2023 New York information session is April 17th. So if you want to learn more about what TFA pop-up 2023 is, one of our pop-up shows, our second annual pop-up show hosted in New York um, this June, join in on our information session. You can find that um, reservation link to join on our website, thefearlessartist.com. And our next artist circle discussion will be held on April 30th. You can also RSVP via our website. So our next um, artist circle talk will be in April. Um, the topic will be protest styles and the power of participation. So again, if you are interested in that topic and you wanna learn more and hear from our panelists, um, please tune in with us, ask your questions, and let's have a great dialogue. So I am your host for the day, Deja Nicole. I am the special programs coordinator here at the Fearless Artist. I've been with the Fearless Artist TFA for a little over two years now. Um, I love working here. It's been a great joy connecting with artists and helping them get their work seen, shared, and sold, and connecting with various mission-driven artists. This year, our theme is the power of participation, where we talk about voting rights and everything that falls under that umbrella, protest styles, and the like. Um, now is your time at the Artist Circle to engage with us in meaningful discussion. So whatever questions you have uh, today, please bring them to the table. Um, we have an awesome um, panelist here with us today, ready to give us insight into her organization and what she does there, as well as answer some of your questions for today. So now I'm going to introduce uh, today's panelist. Her name is Ashley Burnside. She is a chair of the Greater Washington, D.C. Steering Committee for the Human Rights Campaign. She co-leads the Political Action Community Engagement Committee, which engages in political initiatives and engages in community events on behalf of HRC. In that role, she has spearheaded door knocking events and phone banks for LGBTQ supportive candidates. She is originally from Michigan and is a graduate at the University of Michigan, and now she is based in Washington, D.C. Ashley, thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your Sunday to be here with us and um, engage in discussion, meaningful discussion, and answer some of the questions that we have as well as um, our community has. So thank you. I'm going to give you the mic. Please, you know, aside from what I shared just now, give us a little bit more about you and then we'll jump into today's questions. Yeah, thank you all so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation and inviting HRC to be in this space. We're always excited to tell folks about the work that we're doing as an organization and how people can support the fight for LGBTQ plus equity. I'll just say, it's kind of said in my bio already, but I'm not a staff member at HRC. I'm a volunteer. I volunteer with our local steering committee and I'll talk more about how that structure of our volunteer base works, but I just want to name that my role with the organization is really as a volunteer and someone who's just very passionate about LGBTQ equity issues as a queer woman and as somebody who believes that we should have full equality in this country. So that's kind of where I am in this work coming Amazing. to the conversation today. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so we're going to jump into the dis uh, discussion and get started. Great. So what does the Human Rights Campaign do? Yeah, so the Human Rights Campaign, also known as HRC, is the nation's largest LGBTQ plus advocacy organization, and it ultimately is fighting to advance equality for LGBTQ plus people. The organization is trying to promote positive legislative changes for LGBTQ people and also defend against any bad bills at the state, local, and federal level. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you all have seen, there's been a lot of anti-LGBTQ bills, especially anti-trans bills being proposed at the state level. I'll talk a lot more about that. But HRC is one of the organizations really at the forefront of trying to promote policy change that will support the community. And the organization's work is really centered around three pillars of action. The first is mobilizing equality voters nationwide 
which means mobilizing people within the LGBT community to vote, to volunteer, to share their story, to be involved in the movement. The second pillar is educating the public and the community about LGBTQ plus issues. That's largely done through the HRC Foundation, which I'll talk more about. And the third is what I was just talking about, advancing pro-equality policy and also litigation. So HRC sometimes files lawsuits when a bill is passed and a law is there that is inequitable to the LGBTQ plus community. And HRC has different branches within their organization that fulfill these pillars. There's a lobby arm that really helps to promote LGBTQ plus candidates to make sure we have elected officials that represent our community and our values, which is really important. It also has the foundation arm that supports LGBTQ individuals and institutions with resources diff through different programs. An example of one foundation program is Welcoming Schools, which is an HRC program that promotes allowing schools to incorporate LGBTQ plus friendly curriculum within elementary, middle, and high schools, thinking about how we can educate students about what an LGBTQ family is in age-appropriate ways, such as one example of a program that HRC has to think about how we can promote LGBTQ positive culture and environments throughout our nation. And that's kind of the organization broadly. And like I was touching on before, there are steering committees throughout the country that are made up of HRC volunteers. And the goal of those steering committees is to promote HRC's work at the local and state level. So if there's an issue happening within our region or a bill that's being proposed or a candidate that's trying to run or a pride that's happening, the steering committee volunteers will show up to show that HRC is present in those spaces. I'm a part of the Greater Washington DC Steering Committee, which represents not just DC, but also Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and West Virginia. But there's probably a steering committee wherever y'all are based. So that's something you can always look into. And those steering committees take on different initiatives for the organization, like making sure we're at prides when those are happening to help pe educate people on what HRC is doing. I work on local candidate races and do organizing door knocking and phone banking, things like that. Uh, I know that was a lot of information. So happy to touch on any of that more in depth um, or repeat any of that. That was kind of a lot of ones. No, that was a great summarization of what you all do. It was very informative. So thank you. Um, I we do so a lot is the summary, I guess. Yeah. Could you um, drop the website in the yeah. chat for everybody so that they, if they want to get in touch and see what... Um, like chapters or steering committees are in their local area. That way they can stay informed and get in contact with you all. Definitely. So what I just dropped in is just to get straight to the homepage. This webpage, the get involved one is where you can go if you're specifically interested in signing up for a newsletter, signing up to volunteer, learning more about different initiatives the org is doing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to jump on over to our next question. So this year's theme at TFA is the power of participation. What impact would collective participation in the HRC's efforts have? So not just, um, you know, the volunteers and the LGBTQ plus community, but any and everyone that wants to participate. So how would, what impact would collective participation have in the HRC's efforts? Yeah, I think that really the way we win any social movement fight is through everybody getting involved, everybody sharing their story, sharing the support for equity for the community that you're talking about, whether it be LGBTQ people or people of color or women, it's important to have solidarity and everybody lifting up their voice, lifting up their solidarity to promote positive change. HRC has 3 million members and supporters nationwide, people who've either signed up on their website or signed up to volunteer. And those aren't just LGBTQ plus people. Those are also allies. Those are parents. Those are teachers. Those are people who are in some way saying they support our mission of promoting equity and equality for LGBTQ people. So when we can mobilize that base of 3 million people, that is an incredible opportunity to promote change on a policy level, but also at an individual level. I, I truly think that, I mean, just in my lifetime, I'm only 30 years old, we've had such huge progress in promoting positive culture and policy for the LGBTQ community. And I think that's largely because people share their stories about being a queer or trans person 
and what that means for them, what having bills like the Equality Act would mean to help them live their lives more easily, what it would mean for somebody to be able to get married to the person they love, to transition to the gender that they identify as. Saying those stories is how we really create positive change and ultimately achieve our goal of promoting equality. And that's something that LGBTQ people can do and also that supporters of the LGBTQ community can do. And it really just comes down to all of us paying attention to what laws are being introduced in our state and local levels, especially. As someone who lives in DC, I don't have a state that is really promoting bills. So it's important for people who are in states that are promoting both bad and good bills that they're telling their legislators what they think about those things, especially because there may be some people in your state who don't know those things are happening or who can't, who would be really impacted if those bills passed. So it's really all of us coming together and expressing our commitment to promoting LGBTQ equity. Awesome, thank you. So this is an off script question, but um, we are an arts organization or arts company. And I would just wanted to know, have you seen any artist or artwork that um, have supported or made a huge impact with the LGBT Q movement. And if you haven't, that's totally fine. But I know that um, art often stems or is a, a good parallel between what's happening in policy and just things that happen around us. And that's always a good conversation to look at when you see um, artists talking to politicians and saying, hey, like, you know, this is what's going on. You need to listen. And they, we get a lot of response between artists and politics. Um, even when you look at satire, right? That is, that's art. That's art talking about political happening. So have you come across anything? If not, again, that's totally fine. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask. It's a great question given the audience. I appreciate it. I mean, definitely agree with you that art is a huge way to promote representation and quite frankly, just to showcase what love and intimacy can look like for LGBTQ people and to break down misconceptions about what it means to be queer or trans. I think unfortunately, a lot of times media villainizes marginalized communities or promotes unflattering stereotypes that can make people feel ashamed. So anytime that there's art that's showing an LGBTQ person just living their life and their true values, that's really powerful representation. One artist I always think of who's not current, but who had a really big role in the HIV and AIDS epidemic was Keith Haring. He promoted some really powerful paintings and had a really unique style that was used during the AIDS crisis specifically to kind of showcase how the government wasn't acting in the way that they should have been because it was seen as a gay disease. And his artwork really raised awareness of what was happening with the pandemic and was kind of used as a um, rallying cry, if you will, for the movement. And it's his art has become very famous as a result. Um, and it's still sometimes seen a lot in like queer, I've seen a lot of queer shirts that showcase his art and queer books and queer media. So that's a more historic example, I guess, but he's someone I always think of, of the power of art for our community. Thank you. That was a great one. And hopefully, and I know I took you know, I just learned a new artist. So I'm definitely going <laughs> to check out that work. And hopefully this was a new um, artist, maybe for some people here on the call and others that will tune in later and maybe watch this playback too. So thank you. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are doing amazing things today as well. I have no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have another question. How does empowering and mobilizing people at the grassroots level initiate impactful change within the LGBTQ community? Yeah, a lot of our work that we are doing is encouraging LGBTQ people and their supporters to vote. Again, like I was saying earlier, also tracking what legislation is being introduced in their local areas and contacting their elected officials if they either support or don't support something that's happening. And ultimately, even encouraging people to testify at the state level if there's a bill. And that's the way that I think we have the best chance to, to be, defeat all these anti-LGBTQ bills that are being introduced is by sharing our facts and stories about what these bills are going to do and how they're harmful. And that all is done by mobilizing our supporters at these individual levels, helping make sure people understand what bills are being introduced and what the impact would be. And just explaining to people that their voters, as voters, as constituents, they have power 
in talking to their legislators and it's their job to tell their legislator if they're doing something they don't like. And truly by sharing our stories, that's what changes hearts and minds about LGBTQ plus issues. So again, just making sure people are sharing their stories and sharing their truths. And it's really at that grassroots level where cultural change happens at community levels. If you're a teacher thinking about how you can incorporate an LGBTQ friendly curriculum into your classroom, if you work at a corporation thinking about how you can make sure your business policies for employees are inclusive of LGBTQ families or that your healthcare plan is covering gender affirming care for trans people. There's a lot of things that can be done at individual and institutional levels that can really influence positive change for LGBTQ people in these settings like employment and school, hospitals, and all these different parts of day-to-day -day life. And that does come down to individual choices and mobilizing people to understand the impact that they can have just by being a supporter of LGBTQ issues in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think HRC has a really powerful model to mobilize that change through all the different types of work that they do and through having all these groups throughout the country that are trying to represent HRC at more local levels and regional levels to promote our values and our platform for change. Amazing. Thank you. I really like the um, example you gave about the school teachers, you know, looking for those resources. And, um, yeah, even just as a student, having like a book you read as one of your required ones in class that features a queer character that that could be huge for a student who's still figuring out their identity just to see that being something normalized and being talked about, especially in this current political environment, obviously, where some states are getting more resistant to representation like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting world that we're living in. Uh, so, yeah, and obviously, I guess I should add, as you all being artists, thinking about how to incorporate, like we are talking about earlier, LGBTQ people and stories and in your artwork and making sure that it's done in an authentic way to show how multifaceted the community is. Thinking about how to incorporate LGBTQ people of color, LGBTQ people with disabilities, LGBTQ people who are immigrants. Our community is so diverse and unfortunately, the representation too often is white cisgender people, which is not reflective of who the community is. So even thinking one step further, showcasing the breadth of the LGBTQ community and the intersections that we live at is so important. Thank you. This is very informative and enriching. <laughs> um, so our next question is, what are some of the biggest needs HRC addresses for the LGBTQ plus community? One of the biggest things that HRC has been working on for years is a bill called the Equality Act. It would be a federal legislation that would provide consistent and explicit anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people in areas of life like employment and housing, credit, education, any federally funded program. Shockingly, that law does not exist in our country. Some states have chosen to pass LGBTQ anti-discrimination protections, but there's not a federal bill. And in the same way that passing the Civil Rights Act in the 60s was really critical to advancing racial justice because it was putting it at the federal level. We really need the same thing for the LGBTQ community because unfortunately there are some states that probably will not pass bills like that on their own for a long time because of contentious political environments. So having these things at the federal level is really important for members of the community to ensure that we have basic protections in our civil rights law that people cannot discriminate against us or fire us or deny us housing solely because we identify as LGBTQ. So that piece of legislation has always been at the forefront of HRC's work as something that feels like a really important step for the community. But a really, really big current area right now is just protecting the trans community. There have been a lot of state bills that have been introduced and unfortunately are passing that would ban access to gender affirming care for trans people in the state that would force schools to out students to their parents if they choose to identify with a different name or different pronouns, removing LGBTQ curriculum from schools, removing bathroom access and sports participation for trans students, banning drag in public spaces. Tennessee did pass a law that drag performances can no longer happen in areas where children may be. It's the first state in the country to pass a bill like that. And I think that's very relevant to the art community, given that you all know the importance of having the opportunity to have expression and theater and music and spaces and as a way to bring community together. So these are things that, unfortunately, when one state starts passing them, it can pass on to other states and it can be very detrimental. So HRC is right now 
really trying to focus on how can we prevent these bills from passing? How can we educate the public on what they would do and what the harm would be? And really making sure that we minimize the harm as much as possible, while also still promoting the resilience of our community, the strength of our community, acknowledging that even if you ban drag shows of certain contexts in Tennessee, drag performers will continue to exist and thrive. So really trying to hold both those truths at the same time. That is a really big area of of work for HRC in this moment. And HRC also always works a lot on HIV and AIDS and making sure that folks in the community understand how those diseases work and have access to preventative care and treatment to, and information on how they can protect themselves. And also trying to reduce the stigma of HIV because unfortunately, even though we're decades past the beginning of that disease, there's still a lot of stigma. What came to mind when, um you mentioned, I think you said Tennessee was the state yeah. um, that banned um, public drag shows and performances. I don't know why my brain went here, but it reminded me of the history of speakeasies, how, you know, you couldn't have, I believe, like drinking. I don't know the full history of it, but I know speakeasies um, became a place where Uh, People would have to go in these hidden areas to drink and have access of certain types. And that just made me think, okay, well, if they can't perform in these public places anymore, will they start going underground and in more hidden areas to continue their um, livelihood and their art and their practice? And that's something where it becomes you can't, you're preventing somebody's livelihood and their passion, and you may prevent it on that surface level, but you're not going to prevent them to, from continuing doing what they love to do. Yeah, exactly. And it's the slippery slope of how are we defining drag? What if someone is just choosing to wear, if I just choose to wear men's clothing, because that feels good to me. And it's a slippery slope when you're policing how people can dress and perform in public spaces, deeming it as dangerous for people. At the end of the day, there should be this freedom of expression. That's what is supposed to be the case in our country. And it is a form of art. It's a form of community. It's a form of solidarity. Drag means a lot to a lot of people in the LGBTQ community. And it's a way for a lot of people to own their gender identity and expression in a really cool and powerful way. So it is an attack on that by creating these bands and all of these bans on gender affirming care really prevents the opportunity for trans people to have access to health care that allows them to be who they are. So these really do have really detrimental impacts, but there's just a lot of misunderstanding and stigma around what these bills actually are. And that's part of the problem. I was muted. <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad that HRC is creating space for Um, not just the LGBTQ plus community to be more aware of what's happening within their own community, but also providing space and educational programs for anyone just wanting to become more informed and aware and conscious and an ally to this community to say, hey, here's what's going on. This is what this means. And here's how you stand with us and stand together to fight back and create the change, the positive change that needs to be done. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, our political process can be needlessly cumbersome and burdensome and complicated, and it can be hard for an individual person to figure out, well, I know I don't support this bill, but how do I stop it? It, Having an organization that can kind of create the bridge of, well, here's how you can testify. Here's how you can write a letter to your member. Here's who your member even is and how they view about the position. Just providing people with those tools can really help people understand what they can do to fight back. Right. Uh, I, I want to remind everybody in the ch- in the room that if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Ashley is here to answer your questions, um, and we're here to um, promote dialogue around the discussion. So <laughs> you actually touched on this. I don't know if there's any more that you can share on it. But... It's a great transition in. What I will share is... Um there's this website for this. So the United Against Hate Initiative, it really gets to the crux of what I was just talking about. Um, as I was just saying, LGBTQ plus people are under attack in state legislators throughout the country. And this year, there actually have been a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills being introduced. So there's an increasing threat, dis- 
despite how much momentum we've created on a national level of support for LGBTQ people. And HRC created the United Against Hate Initiative to organize this nationwide mobilization of pro-equality voices to really prevent these bills from passing through state legislative chambers. There's tracking tools that HRC has where people can see if I live in this state, what bills are being introduced to in my state? Where are they in committee right now? What would these bills do? HRC can connect people to sign on letters, um, ways to call their members of Congress or their state members and ways that they can testify. And people can sign up for email alerts to get notified on what's happening. You can also advocate on a national level. So it's a way to help people figure out within their region what they can be doing to fight back against these bills. And it creates like talking points as well for people to use to help understand what they can say and how to frame their story in a way to fight back. So this is kind of just the initiative HRC is currently working on to address everything we've been talking about. That's awesome. Thank you. Let's see. So what are some immediate actions we can take to stand up for equality? Yeah, I, the biggest thing I guess I would say is go on the HRC website. I put the link in there of how to get involved. Feel free to sign up to volunteer or to get email alerts. To I would encourage you all, wherever you live, look up what is happening in your state. Is there one of these anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ pills being introduced? If so, I really encourage you to think about can you call your member and tell them that you oppose it? Can you share your story on social media about why you oppose it? Talk to family members who maybe wouldn't know what these issues are about why you oppose this and why they should call their members. Testify even. I It breaks my heart what's happening in Tennessee, but I don't live in Tennessee, so I can't really do a ton of about it right now. But somebody who lives in Tennessee can do a lot about it. And really, I just encourage you all to talk to people in your community about LGBTQ people about trans issues, try to fight back against the misconceptions that are out there. And that can be done through artwork, right? Trying to recreate the narrative of what it means to be trans, to go through gender affirming care, to be a student, to be in school and have your identity invalidated by your teachers, by bathrooms, by what sports you can and can't join. I've seen a lot of really powerful art campaigns that showcase what it means to be trans in today's America. And I think that that can be a really powerful way to uplift stories and also making sure the representation of LGBTQ people is empowering and shows the solidarity and love in our community. March 31st is a day called Transgender Day of Visibility. It happens every year as a day to celebrate the resilience of the trans community. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of marches happening around the country in honor of Trans Day of Visibility. So also if y'all wanna support events like that, that's a great way to show up in solidarity and celebrate the queer community in this moment where there's a lot of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric going around. And I also just encourage y'all to support federal legislation, of course, like the Equality Act that would help LGBTQ people. And I always have to say vote, <laughs> please vote, always vote, vote in the primary races, the big races, the small races. It's so, so, so important outside of LGBTQ issues too, obviously it's important for all social issues. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure to vote. Thank you so much. Yes, voting is very important. And again, that is really what our theme of the year is all about, the power of participation. Your voice matters. You're not just a number. Your voice matters. You standing up at the polls and taking a stand, using your voice and just, standing firm in what you believe in will move mountains. And that's what the power of participation is all about because we can only do so much as an individual, but when we stand together as a community, what can be done is unimaginable. So I do exactly. believe that that was our last question. So Ashley, I just wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to join us and have this amazing conversation with us to educate us on what the HRC does, what some of your programming is and how we can get involved and stand together. Um, if there's any other questions from the room, um, please feel free to take yourself off of mute or you know, put your questions in the chat. And um, once we get through those, or if there are none, then I just have some very brief announcements to get through as, uh, before we close out. 
well, I would like to say thank you again so much for having me. And I really appreciate y'all making the space. Yeah, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Okay, well, seeing none, hearing none, I will go ahead and close us out. So just as a reminder, um, in April, we will be having another artist circle discussion um, with the topic being protest styles and the power of participation. So you can find that at thefearlessartist.com to RSVP for this talk. Um, we'll be putting out the announcement early this upcoming, or sorry, late this upcoming week as we enter April and um, just stay connected to our social media accounts and our email listings to stay connected to all of our happenings. Again, we have um, on April 17th, our TFA pop-up 2023 New York information session. So if you want to show your art or just want to find out what we do at our TFA pop-ups, again, you can find that out at our link, tfapopup.com and RSVP for the information session to see how to get your work seen, shared, and sold with us and learn about our programming. If you want to view past Artist Circle events, you can find us on YouTube at The Fearless Artist and check out all of our previous um, The Fearless Artist Artist Circle talks. This one will be uploaded to YouTube so you can go back and watch it. I know this was a wealth of information that we gained. So if you're like, man, I missed it. I wanna go back. I wanna you know, learn more. And what did she say? By all means, you know, go to the, go to our YouTube and you can play it back. Um, uh -oh. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at deja at tfapopup2021.com or find us at thefearlessartist.com. I'm happy to answer any art related questions that you have, or if you have a topic that you want us to discuss here on the artist circle, please shoot me an email. If you say, hey, Deja, like great discussions that you're having. I know somebody that would be perfect for a talk. Send them my way, please. We want to keep these discussions going about topics that you are interested in. And again, talking about the power of participation. So I just want to thank you all for taking time out of this wonderful sunny Sunday, depending on where you are. I'm here in Maryland and it's gorgeous outside. So I'm going to go and take a walk and get some fresh air. But thank you all again for joining us. Follow us on all of our social platforms. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Ashley. Bye, y'all.